fun. And I am with Michelle Zietler, our program YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash TV. So please feel free to share it far and wide with anyone you think might benefit um, from today's presentation. Probably you all know about the SAM Fund and our programs, but I just wanted to give you a quick background or for anyone that's listening to this for the first time. SAM Fund is a nonprofit organization based in Boston, and our goal is to help young adults with the financial struggles that they face as a result of a cancer diagnosis. We provide direct financial assistance in addition to these webinars, and our grant application is actually available now through July 11th. That's www.samfund.org. It's up there on our website. You fall within our eligibility requirements and are struggling financially because you've gone through cancer treatment um, at any point in your life, doesn't need to be recently, then please take a look and submit an application and hopefully we will be able to help you or point you in a direction of another organization that can. Probably you have seen from all of our social media pushes and messages on our website and elsewhere, our new tagline at the SAM Fund is cancer isn't free. Because all of us know as young adults that when we go through cancer treatment, we just focus on that day when they will tell us we are cancer free. And there's so much conversation around those words cancer free. And when you really take a hard look at it, cancer isn't free. Cancer is the opposite of free. Sasha Rothschild gets it because she's lived it. She was touched by cancer at age 17 when her mom was diagnosed with brain cancer, and she understands all of the financial and practical implications better than most people um, who have not faced something like this. And so, unfortunately, Sashka's mom did not survive, and Sashka channeled her grief and her energy into something really, really meaningful and incredibly productive, this organization called Standby, which she's going to tell you about. But I can tell you about it, is that it's amazing. Um, Standby isn't just about raising money, although certainly that's an important part. Art, but it's really honored to be here because I'm such a huge fan of what you guys do and um, being at comedy night last week was really um, such a special moment uh, to sort of just see how how incredibly touching and 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 beautiful it is the way that you uh, interact with your own community so I'm really um, I feel really honored um, and so I uh, I just want to start by saying if anyone ever has any questions I'm happy to answer anything as it comes up. So um, I'm happy to sort of talk a little bit about standby and, and what it is that we do and why it is that we're here and what our goals are and you know and, and answer any questions anyone might have. So um, I guess I just want to start with like a little bit of history. So Sam sort of um, actually Dr. I'm so sorry to jump in. Can you just share your screen because we're not seeing it yet. Oh that would probably be helpful. <laughs> Sorry. Minor detail. Minor detail. So there we go. Is it there? It is. All right. So thanks. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So um, I, I just kind of want to give um, a tiny bit of background. Um, I uh, was raised in California um, in Santa Cruz, and uh, when I was 17, as Sam said, my mom was diagnosed with. A stage three um, astrocytoma, which was encased in her brainstem, so it was sort of a, a really, really rare and sort of tricky diagnosis, and kind of hit us um, really off guard as as a cancer diagnosis does. So, it was my senior year of high school, and I had taken classes so that I could graduate early and hopefully head to Europe uh, before college started. And instead, I stayed home. Um, and drove to chemo every day at Stanford um, and waited for radiation to be over and ultimately, um, you know, was at home 
taking care of my mom, feeding her, bathing her, um, sort of all of those things. So we had a we had a pretty good run of eleven months, but um, but it was sort of a you know it wasn't really anything that that, that could be done. So you know it was one of those things where there's really no way for me to to talk about my life other than the before and after the diagnosis and. You know, we had we had a great amount of support from our community. We had people that were driving to and from chemo. We had people delivering meals, um, and all of those things were really great. So this was in 1998. So there really like wasn't the internet yet. Um, so my sort of access to support was very limited and very analog. You know, we had like phone trees, and and people were calling and coming over. So I didn't really have the benefit or the notion that you could connect to people other than those that you knew, like in your own circle. So um, I ended up going to culinary school. I wanted to open a restaurant. I thought that was going to be amazing. And I just really couldn't get, um, you know, the experience of what happened with my mom and and just sort of the, the need to try and be, like, helpful sort of out of my brain. So um, as the year sort of progressed, um, we sort of started realizing that like there's not only this giant healthcare crisis, but there's this giant cancer crisis. Um, you know, one in two men, one in three women are diagnosed with cancer now, which is pretty obscene. Um, that means that everyone knows someone. So what I found really interesting about setting up standby is that there's no one that I deal with, whether it's my banker at Chase or the woman who prints my business cards. Um, or my attorney whose son has leukemia that doesn't have some kind of personal story um, that relates back to cancer. So my husband, who's my co-founder, um, happens to be a, sort of one of the top creative directors in New York City and has worked on digital strategy and building websites. Um, for an agency here in New York where we're based, you know, for Nike and HBO and WaterAid, and we had this moment where we were like, well, okay, I had this sort of like life-changing experience. He has this sort of like incredible knowledge on how to build, um, you know, beautiful websites that are really helpful, um, and sort of understanding that there's, you know, these two million people diagnosed every year, and basically everyone's seeing some kind of financial devastation. Um, we decided to build standby. So that was about three and a half years ago. We were actually sitting at a bar that we met at in Soho in New York, and we started scribbling down like ideas for like a home page on a napkin and worked on it and worked on it and worked on it in our spare time um, and ultimately came up with with sort of the idea that we'd have now, which is ultimately a place um, for people to come and bring together their communities, their friends, family, their, their loved ones, um, to gather everyone to sort of base camp so that people can help pitch in to help subsidize the cost of care, treatment, rent, gas, um, and keep people updated. So there's a couple of things that, um, that, that we're trying to do that are slightly that are slightly different from um, a lot of the great organizations that are out there. Um, one of the things that was really important um, for me uh, was to try and solve the problem of, of what happens when you get diagnosed with cancer and how you know your your sort of finances and life can be devastated. And we really feel like to solve a problem, you can't be everything to everyone. Um, so we're cancer focused and doesn't really matter what kind of cancer you have. It doesn't really matter to me necessarily what stage you're at. You can be just diagnosed. You can be in the middle of treatment. Um, you can be through your diagnosis but still be dealing with bills um, and, and credit card issues and you know any number of those things that end up piling up uh, you know when you're in the middle of, of trying to get healthy. So that was like the main thing that we wanted to start with. The other thing that sort of makes us different um, than most other platforms is that we built in a split payment backend that allows for donations to hit your account in real time. So unlike um, some other platforms, 
you're never going to wait three months until the end of your fundraiser. We never hold on to anyone's money. Um, donations come in. They're split between our payment processor, which is called WePay. It's the same thing as PayPal. They're just a lot easier to work with. Um, we take a small percentage, and then the money hits directly into your account so that you can use it for what you need to, um, which sort of leads to the second part of that, which is that we, I don't care what anyone needs to use any of this money for. If you have need that's based on, you know, exorbitant insurance bills or, or hospital costs or, you know, any kind of medical related costs, then that's, then that's clearly on the, um, you know, on the list. But, you know, there's so much that happens um, that doesn't necessarily relate to your time spent at an oncology center or in treatment. Um, you know, whether that's vitamin water because you're too, you know, sick and dehydrated from, from chemo, or if that's gas to get you there, or if that's help, you know, with someone taking care of your kids because you don't feel well, if that's help with your rent, it's all good. Um, you know, we're sort of really aware of, of how many things can be affected, and, and, and we're really happy to, to be able to support any one of those. Um, the other thing that we paid really special attention to um, was the way that we designed the site. So, as I had mentioned, it, it was designed by my husband, and clearly I'm very biased, but he's really, um, he really is good at what he does and took a lot of care in trying to make sure that, that it was as easy to use and navigate as possible. Um, you know, there's no need to me to feel like, you know, because, you know, you're dealing with a cancer diagnosis and it feels like your life is, you know, kind of breaking that you should have to deal with something that's hard to navigate or, or hard to understand. So um, I guess I want to sort of just give you a little bit of an inside look into how it, how it works to set up a fundraiser. Um, it's really quite um, it's quite simple, and it can and can be done in less than ten minutes, which we are really um, adamant about making sure was the case. So, but they're set up in three steps. Um, the first step is just filling out a bit of um, some sort of profile information. Um, you're able to toggle your goal for however much you need to raise. You can enter in a time frame. We have three month limits um, right now, and, and the reason we do that is really to give your donors a sense of, um, a sense of urgency. You know, statistically speaking, when people know that there's sort of a deadline, they're much more apt to want to donate and help, um, and so that was an important thing for us. That doesn't mean that we won't ever extend them. I've done that multiple times for people. It's, it's certainly flexible. Um, but it was really something we designed to try and give everyone as, as big of a leg up um, as we could. So um, we ask you a couple questions um, to try and get you know, some information that um, can connect to people in your community. We ask you um, how you found out you were sick. We ask where you're finding the most sort of financial difficulty. And then we ask you know, what has been sort of the moment in this experience that has been um, the most sort of eye-opening or what you feel most grateful for. Um, that, that step we've heard, it, you know, maybe takes five minutes. Um, the next step um, takes maybe 30 seconds. Um, we pre-populate a field um, for WePay with your email, and all you have to do is enter in a password. Um, you don't have to connect it to your bank account to get set up and going. You don't have to have your routing number. We did this for two reasons. One is that that stuff can be kind of tedious, and if you want to get up and running, like we want to make that as easy as possible. We also did that because we know that sometimes um, friends and family are setting up fundraisers for a loved one. Um, and if I was setting up a fundraiser for my mom, you know, if I had this, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't have her routing information, you know, on me if I was getting something going. So we wanted to make it as easy as possible for people to um, set something up if it, if it wasn't personally made for them. Um, 
And as I mentioned before, the donations, when they come in, um, are sort of automatically split between WePay, between Standby, and then go directly into your WePay account. Um, to withdraw the money, all you have to do is log into WePay with that password that you had entered, um, connect to your bank account, and it'll withdraw automatically. So what that means for the duration of your fundraiser is that there's nothing you have to do when donations come in. As they come in, they'll get withdrawn by WePay, put into your bank account, and you can use them however you need. So that's the second step. The third step is really about connecting to your community. So we've enabled um, as sort of easy a social share as possible. We can upload your email addresses. We connect you to Twitter. We connect you to your Facebook, um, to basically all of your digital outlets so that you can send your fundraiser out to everyone you know. Um, the thing is, you know, people have an average of about, of about 340 friends on Facebook. Some people have more, some people have less. But if you think about it, if everyone gave $10, you know, which is about two coffees, um, that's $3,400. You know, what we've noticed um, with standby, what we've noticed with a lot of things is that it's not about people giving a lot, it's about a lot of people giving a little. So one of the things that we, are, we try and sort of bring some awareness to is that it's, it's not actually this insurmountable obstacle to get the support you need. You have the sort of networks there, um, and it's really just about giving people a platform and an opportunity to do so. So, um, so that's sort of something I guess I'll touch on in a little bit later. One of the other things that we did to try and make it as simple as possible is that the website is responsive, which all that means is that it'll work on any device you use. So it'll work on um, a desktop, it'll work on a laptop, it'll work on an iPad or a tablet, and it'll work on your phone so that you can update wherever you are, you can create it wherever you are, but also your community can donate and check in on you wherever they are. Um, so one of the things that, that is really helpful with that is that, you know, we, guess we see a lot of donations happening from people's phones. So people will send a fundraiser around, they'll get the email on their phone, they'll see a Facebook post, and they're really uh, sort of this incredible ease with which they can donate. So that was just sort of one of the other things that felt really important to us. I guess the thing that we sort of um, wanted to talk about, and when I say we, this is um, my husband and I, who's my co-founder, and then I really had sort of wanted her to be able to actually be on this webinar too, but um, I feel really, really, really lucky because our um, community organizer is a woman named Dina, and she's amazing, and she was diagnosed with stage four metastatic breast cancer when she was 29 um, in San Francisco. She created a fundraiser on standby, and it was amazing, and she raised close to $9,000 in about three weeks, um, and in a way that was exactly as I had mentioned, it was really small amounts from a lot of really, really normal, kind, um, generous, mm -hmm. compassionate people. Um, and we talk a lot about what made her, her fundraiser successful. Um, after her fundraiser, which was a year ago, we stayed in touch, um, and now she works with us. And so I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky to have her because uh, now I feel like we have a really great opportunity to have multiple perspectives, um, both from a caregiver side, from my side, and from a patient side. So one of the things that, um, that can happen um, is people set up a fundraiser, and it's pretty easy to do. It's set up. It's online. And then there can be a little bit of a disconnect with, with understanding sort of what to do once it's up. And we understand how difficult it can feel um, to need support or ask for help. And the thing that, that's really sort of important to try and remember, um, difficult to implement, but important to remember, is that people really, really, really want to help. When my mom was sick, 
um, she was in education and she um, was a single mom. She got her master's um, when my brother and I were in elementary school and she was working full time and she went and got her master's at night. So she was, she was quite the badass. And, um, and when she was sick, we had all of these friends that really wanted to help. And it wasn't really all that normal for her to accept help like that. And we had a really, really good friend who um, wanted to come over once a week and sit with my mom and chat and have tea. And she wanted to help paint my mom's nails. And um, my mom never painted her nails. Um, it was kind of this thing that was really out of character for her. But I remember watching once a week when Cindy would come over and she would sit with my mom and I remember watching and thinking, oh, I get it. Like, my mom doesn't need her nails painted, but Cindy really needs to be there to help. And it was this sort of amazing epiphany that I had at 17 that, um, that our friend got way more out of helping than my mom did necessarily out of being helped. And it was this sort of amazing idea that that ultimately, you know, people are really, really honored to be able to help. And I'm sort of, um, this quote that's up there, which is a Brene Brown quote, and it's one of my favorites, and she's sort of one of our favorites. We're a little bit obsessed with her, actually. Um, but, you know, we really feel like one of the things that we're trying to overcome is this idea that, that there's anything wrong with needing help. So um, what we do to try and sort of bring, you know, that to, you know, to, that to light is, you know, we have this big donor wall on the profiles. Um, and as people contribute, their faces start appearing. This is actually um, a screenshot of Dina's fundraiser. Um, it's sort of like, you know, spread like wildfire. And we... Um, it was sort of this amazing thing to watch because she started getting notes from people all over the country, um, actually all over the world, um, and it was roughly about two degrees of separation. You know, it's sort of friends of friends um, that are able to see, you know, what's going on in someone's fundraiser. So one of the things that um, ends up being a really helpful piece of the tool, you know, you set up the fundraiser, three steps, you send it to your community. Um, but one of the things that we built in that, you know, in some ways sort of mimics what you can do on CaringBridge um, is we allow people to post updates, um, which has been used in multiple ways. One, you know, big main reason why we did that was so that you can tell your story once instead of 70 times. So when my mom was sick, I probably spent like a good two hours a day saying the same thing over and over again on multiple phone calls. Oh, how are her scans? Like, how did chemo go? Do you need us to come over? Um, and it was really um, pretty tedious, and I, I didn't love having to do that. So one of the things that we did was built in a system um, that allows a fundraiser to post updates. The updates are easily shareable on Facebook, on Twitter, via email, so that you can just tell your story one time. Um, and people can connect and follow instead of like 70 times and fielding text after text after text and phone call. Um, so that was sort of another small piece of what, of what we're doing. Um, this, is, um, this is Dina. Um, this is a, a sort of shot of her fundraiser. Um, this is sort of at, at, a, at a point where she was, you know, almost, almost to the end. She had 54 notes from people um, who were able to sort of check in with her, leave her words of encouragement. Um, and one of the things that she tells me uh, was something that she did was that she kept the tab open um, on her, her browser when she was working, and she would watch the notes come in, and it was sort of this thing that, like, kind of kept, kept, um, kept some, like, positivity going throughout the day when things were feeling a little bit a little bit crappy. So um, so the way that, that we've seen sort of communities interact um, when they're able to sort of like lend their support both financially 
emotionally um, has been pretty incredible. Um, we have the ability for fundraisers to upload photos. Um, we have the ability for fundraisers to upload video. We have some fundraisers right now um, who have been chronicling their treatment um, with video, and it's this really great way um, to tell your story if you don't feel like like writing an update or writing, you know, sort of a journal entry feels comfortable or if you have any bandwidth to do that. Um, the idea is to, to have as many ways and outlets to just share your information. You know, what we know about donation, what we know about support, what we know about giving is that people want to do it. They desperately want to do it. They do it more when they feel connected to someone, when they can read someone's story, when they see a picture, when they really feel like, oh my God, like that could be me. Um, so we try and figure out as many ways that we can, uh, we can allow for that to happen on standby. Um, these are some of the notes um, that Dina has received. You know, honestly, we could have pulled you know, I don't know, hundreds. Um, I kind of have too many um, favorites to count. Um, but some of these are the ones that really um, have struck me and her as, um, you know, as being really sort of important and, uh, and then meaningful. Um, you know, I guess to, to sort of wrap up a little bit, um, and then, uh, you know, I'm happy to sort of answer any questions if they come up. But, um, you know, there's this sort of giant problem. Um, and there's been a lot of great sort of eye-opening, you know, sharing on social media of article after article about how um, huge this healthcare problem is. You know, the fact that everyone's basically getting sick and everyone's having a hard time. Um, is that, you know, it sort of harkens back to why we're cancer focused. Like, there are way too many people that are experiencing the same shit, basically, that I did. My mom died 15 years ago, almost. Like, that's a really long time for this problem to be going on. So, um, we certainly have a point of view about how obscene, um, how uncalled for it is that people are still in this situation. Um, and that, I think, we're able to sort of speak to in a, in a more pointed way, you know, because we're talking about the cancer problem. Um, you know, ultimately, we'd love to be able to figure out ways to help, you know, other people that are in different sort of medical crises. But, um, you know, when my mom died, it was completely devastating. And, you know, I just, really wasn't sure that I was ever going to be able to sort of figure out a way to recover. And, you know, it kind of takes everyone as long as it takes them. But um, at the end of the day, um, we're really, really, really deeply committed to figuring out how to make this better, um, both in the moment, but both and also in the long run. Um, you know, we're, we have we have a lot of really great support in helping to sort of implement a lot of the best practices of, of you know, there's a lot of great things that we've seen in, in, in campaigns that we're going to, you know, looking to sort of implement um, to try and just be as helpful as possible because at the end of the day, like that's all that I really care about is, is that whatever we build is as easy to use, is as helpful as possible. And, and gets people connected to as much direct support um, as they need. So um, I think that that sort of wraps up a little bit uh, of sort of the overarching um, kind of reason we're here and what we're trying to do. Um, I don't know, if, uh, Sam or, or Michelle, is there anything that um, that maybe comes up or you can think of that um, that you'd like to know more about or any sort of any question I can answer? We actually do have a bunch of questions that have come up and I didn't want to interrupt you because you are on such a roll. So we can okay. go back, um, cool. you know, through them now. And if anyone has any others, just feel free to chime in. Sasha, you are awesome. 
first of all. And I think that what's amazing about standby, <clears throat> excuse me, is that you've sort of pulled together the best parts of a lot of the sites that are out there and are just doing this amazing work, providing this resource to people who are struggling to pay their medical bills. I mean, just this week, you and I both shared on Facebook the article about how people aren't even getting treatment sometimes because they can't afford to pay the bills, <clears throat> excuse me, or the co-pays or whatever. And so I think to give people a resource that can help them in real time, you know, one of the problems that we see at the SAM Fund um, with our grants program is that we have a very long application process. And so we got a lot of applications from people who need help yesterday, and the best we can do is say you need to apply and then wait a few months until we're able to let you know for sure. And I think that what you're doing is amazing because if someone needs help tomorrow, you could potentially give them help tomorrow. So that's well, just my take on standby. I, I just think it's such an important resource in the cancer community. And <clears throat> excuse me, I just thank you for all of the heart that you clearly put into this and all of the thought. And um, I just think it's great. I think everybody should know about it. So let me go back okay. to some of the questions that came sure. up. Um, and we'll sort of go in order from the earliest slides on through these last ones. So one of the things that you mentioned earlier on when people are setting up pages is that you ask how people found out they were sick. Uh-huh. So why is that? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, so this is slightly, slightly scientific, which I can assure you is definitely not my background, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of explain it as, in as layman terms as possible. But one thing that we know um, um, from study after study after study after study um, with regard to behavioral science is that People are the most generous, they share the most, when two things happen in a story. One is that they see or feel some kind of distress, and then it's followed by some sense of empathy. So um, there's sort of these amazing professors at MIT that have done like these, you know, plethora of studies. So we've talked to a handful of them and realized that there's a couple of things that we could ask people so that we can help them sort of create a story that's as emotionally connective to people in their community and to potential donors as possible. You know, at first we sort of had this, like, tell your story and, like, a, here's this blank page. And then I thought, that's crazy because I don't know that I could just sit down and, like, write my story. I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, and that's really intimidating. So we tried to sort of ask questions that would give um, readers, donors, your community some um, sense of history. So asking how people found out they were sick, people can answer it in multiple ways. There's no real right answer, but you know, it can be detailed, it can be um, general, but the idea is to sort of give um, you know, readers or visitors to your fundraiser sort of a, a starting off point to sort of understand where you are, what's going on, on um, to kind of give you, you know, really like the best, like to me, I, again, it's like I really want to make this as easy as possible so that you don't really have to think about too, too much or someone doesn't have to think about too, too much. So that's sort of um, why that question is in there. We try to sort of create, you know, some sense of history for, for a reader, um, some specificity with regard to sort of what the actual problems are, like what's feeling financially difficult. And then at the end, the reason why we ask what people are sort of most grateful for is that, um, you know, there is always something that's really incredibly moving about, you know, being in a crisis. You know, I, I, I could go on and on about the things that I, 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 I don't even know what I would do without the sort of generosity and, and graciousness of so many people. So that's sort of how we end it. But, um, but long story longer, that's why that question was in there. Excellent. Thanks. So we have a logistics question also. When you were talking about setting up the page and then linking to WePay and being able to enter your bank account info separately, um, especially, I mean, whether or not you have it on you at that moment or somebody is setting up a page for you and doesn't have that information, does uh -huh. Standby ever get the bank account info? And, um, no. No. Okay. No, then no. no follow-up question. We never, um, we're never holding on to the money. We never have any of the, you know, the account info. It's never, um, 
yeah, I have no interest in ever holding on to anyone's money. I want to distribute it as quickly as possible. <laughs> okay, another question. Um, and you sort of touched on this a little bit when you were talking about the notes that Dina received and how she kept the screen open while she was at work. Mm -hmm. If somebody can't do that, how does somebody find out who's donating to their page? Do they get email um, so notification or do they need to log in and check it out? That's a really good question and thank you for bringing it up because I totally skipped over that. So um, we have a pretty um, comprehensive um, emailing system set up so that um, not only are, is a fundraiser um, kept updated as to who's donating, um, how much, um, we have a whole thank you note system built in so you can either customize the thank you notes or we have something that's pre-filled if, you, if you're not up for it. Um, pardon me. And um, so thank you notes go out to every one of your donors. Um, donors are kept updated as to what your progress is to, as far as reaching your goal. Um, anyone that's basically like followed or donated um, is sort of alerted as to what's going on. Um, you know, they'll see sort of notes they can check back in. Um, but as a fundraiser, um, you can always log into your profile. We sort of built it in a way that we thought would be incredibly easy in that your version of your dashboard looks exactly the same as what it looks like on live. So it's basically a live edit. Um, you can log in at any time. You can check your progress. Um, you, can, you can change what's on there. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers it fully, but, um, but you, can, you can always log in um, and you're always sort of kept updated if someone writes you a note if someone donates, those things are automatically um, emailed to you. Great. So next question is about how this whole thing works because we know that people are super uncomfortable asking their friends and family for money and I agree with you. I think what you said is spot on that people want to help and I know when I went through treatment also everyone said, well, what can I do? Yeah. And we didn't always have an answer to that question um, and the most helpful things like what you said, is when people would say, here's what I'm going to do to help you, right, and just sort of put it out there um, as something concrete and um, specific. But for people who are still uncomfortable if they're facing a giant medical bill that they need help with or whatever the case may be that they're raising money for, they're uncomfortable asking friends and family for money. So do you have, either from your own experience or from any of your fundraisers, any tips or best practices on sort of how people can overcome that discomfort and, um, you know, start asking and feeling good about it? Yeah, I mean, I think that's tough, but I think that, um, you know, ultimately, there's a couple of things that can happen. Um, as an example, we had a fundraiser named Kristen, and she um, lived on the East Coast, and when I sort of, I, I'm using air quotes right now, but when I met her, um, she uh, felt too uncomfortable setting up a fundraiser. She felt really embarrassed and hadn't told anyone when she was sick um, and had asked me if she could set up a fundraiser um, and not put her name on it. And I'm, um, I try really hard to be as incredibly flexible as possible, but, but you know, you kind of need to have a name on a fundraiser. Um, <laughs> so, you know, she ended up setting one up. And it's actually, to me, one of like, the, the biggest success stories we've had because um, you know, she raised maybe, I think, $1,500, which was able to, you know, like really make a dent in a lot of bills. Um, but she ended up posting about 16 or 17 updates um, and ended up using standby really sort of as a, as a journaling system, um, not necessarily caring so much, you know, that people were reading it, um, but really, really, really opened up. And, you know, some of them were really hard to read, you know, they were about scans not going really well or actually losing her house, and, but that's sort of how it goes, right? Like, sometimes shit is not great, and you kind of have to just put it out there. So I think that there's something about writing as if, you know, no one's reading. Um, sometimes that helps you actually just put out what's going on. And when you, when you write and sort of share in a way that's really vulnerable, um, 
that's actually when people connect the most. So um, one of the other things that I think can be helpful is that you know, it can be hard to sort of ask people to donate, um, which you don't necessarily have to do per se. By sending around your fundraiser, it's pretty obvious like what happens. There's these big pitch and buttons. You know, they say pitch in. They don't say like, give me money. They say pitch in, and and so you can be pretty um, you can be pretty passive about it that way. But um, what you can ask people to do if it feels slightly uncomfortable to, to ask them flat out is you can ask them if they don't mind sharing your fundraiser. People are really happy to share things, um, either via email, via Facebook, or via Twitter. Um, so one of the things that we found um, has felt more comfortable and potentially helpful for people is, you know, not saying like, hey, look, I'd really like love your support here, but hey, how do you feel about like sharing, posting my fundraiser on Facebook, or how do you feel about sharing this profile on Facebook? Um, and sometimes that can actually have like a big ripple effect because, you know, you have friends that are then sending it to their community. Um, and then your friends are really like the ones that are incredibly happy and willing to ask their, their other friends to sort of donate. So there's sort of a couple ways, I think, to go about it. But, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, it can feel really uncomfortable. And I find myself in, the, in sort of in that position a lot because, you know, running this site, um, I, you know, I've, I've paid for it um, basically with everything I have in my savings. Um, and so when I get to the point where, like, I need someone to, like, help me shoot a video and tell a story because I think it's important, like, I find myself in that same situation of, like, needing to ask for people's help. And, and I talk about people doing it all, all the time, and I still find it to be uncomfortable. But, um, but I've, I've been able to make really amazing stuff. We made a really beautiful video of Dina, and we're able to share and tell her story. But we only were able to do that because I asked. Um, and it was uncomfortable, but I did it. And now we have this beautiful video. So, so I totally understand. Um, you know, so there's some passive ways to go about it, and then there's just like sometimes the big leap, <clears throat> because you know, this is a place where everyone's dealing with the same issue. This isn't a place where like your fundraiser to try and pay off your like hospital bills is going to be next to someone's like cat's eye surgery or kids' little league game. Like this is where everyone is like dealing with the same crap, and so it you know people know what's going on here. So. I, don't know I think that's so great, too, because nobody wants to put a price tag on health and wellness and survival, you know, and I think that's part of the reason why there's such discomfort around this whole conversation. Part of it is not wanting to ask for help, and part of it, from what we've heard at the SAM Fund, I don't want to generalize for everybody, but from what we've heard, um, people don't want to seem ungrateful. You know, I know for me, I over the years have been told so many times, oh, you must be so grateful to have survived cancer that nothing else matters. And yes, of course, I'm grateful to still be here. And also, there are a lot of bills that go along with it, and sometimes it gets really hard. And so I think being able to break this down a little bit, um, you know, and like we said in the very beginning, create this community on your website um, between people who are all dealing with the same stuff is just so critically important. Um, yeah. And so I a couple actually, more. I just, sorry, go ahead. I just, there's one thing I totally forgot, and I, um, you'll have to excuse me. I have. Um, I have a tiny baby at home. I have a seven and a half month old, and he sort of like sucks the, like, the gray matter out of my brain sometimes. But um, one of the things that we we spent a lot of time working on, and Dina actually was really instrumental in making this happen, is we created a resources section, um, which was basically built so that we can make this problem um, as sort of easily easy um, as possible. So some of the things that we we've created already. Um, and that we're making more of, for example, is we've created a bunch of um, pinnable images. So um, we've designed um, basically these sort of pictures or graphics that you can share on Facebook, you can share on Pinterest, you can share via email, you can share on Twitter, you can share them however you want. Um, but they're graphic and visual, and they not only sort of have ones that speak to sort of how insane the cancer problem is, so that, you know, when you're sharing something, you can really help, you know, it's not just about you and, like, you needing help personally. It's like, 
you know, one in two men, one in three women. That's like everyone. So we have a resources section where you can go grab these images that are already made. They're really beautiful. Um, and those are things that you can use to share um, so that you're not having to like sit and type a sentence that's like, I need help or I don't know how to even say this. Like you can pull one of those and it's super easy. Um, we also have uh, a social media guide where there's actually um, Facebook um, and Twitter, like pre-written um, sort of sentences and, and quotes that you can use and you can just pull them. You don't even have to write anything yourself. Um, Dean has actually written all of them because she's amazing. And so you can go and grab those. So we sort of try to like take the terrifying sitting down at your computer, like what do I write piece of things out of the equation. So I would, um, I would really highly recommend um, anyone if they wanted to check out the site and go to the resources section and really sort of see all of the things that are built in there because um, those are really to help with this problem too. So I'm sorry, that's something I... No, that's all, that's all great stuff and I commend you for even doing half of this with a newborn at home. So the fact that you've done as much as you have is, is pretty amazing. Um, so a couple more questions. How long is the average fundraiser that you've seen and um, on average, what, how much do most people raise? Um, most people go for the sort of um, the three months. It's sort of um, it's sort of automated at three months. You can change it to up to anything under that. One of the things that Dina actually did with her profile um, that was pretty clever is she actually made it shorter um, to give a sense of urgency. On the other hand, we've had fundraisers that, that we've extended multiple times to try and accommodate sort of a length of time that felt appropriate for the fundraiser. So, you know, I'd say that three months is the average. Um, so, you know, there's two things to that. One is if it's shorter, you can, you know, again, it gives um, donors or your community sort of a sense that you need it quickly and that actually can um, help people feel a sense of urgency and want to donate. But um, but longer also gives you an opportunity to share more, to, to have it sort of up longer, um, to try and, you know, reach as many people as possible. Um, but I would say three months is sort of the average. And um, I think a couple thousand dollars right now um, is the average. And, and this is the thing, is that we've seen a lot more um, and we've seen less. Um, and a lot of what that depends on is how sort of like vulnerable you're able to be, you know, like how, how willing um, do you feel to sort of share your story? You know, there's all these notes that are up there and I can't tell you how many of them say stuff like, um, I'm able to like look at my life or day differently because of the honesty with which you talk about your story. Um, those things are really, really, really powerful. And I, I get like thanked all the time for talking about what happened to my mom. Um, I see fundraisers getting thanked all the time too. So, you know, there's just no getting around the fact that the more, um, the more vulnerable you, fe you feel comfortable being generally, like, you know, sort of the higher sort of financial success rate we see. That doesn't mean that if you don't feel comfortable talking about things that you won't raise any money, but um, but that's that's sort of, you know, the reality of it. And we're, we're really doing our best to make it as sort of comfortable and safe a place to do that as possible. That's so great. You know, and I, we have one last question, which you sort of touched on, um, but from what we see in our grants program here, I think it's important to restate. Um, and that's about, so anybody who has had a cancer diagnosis or knows someone who has had a cancer diagnosis can set up a fundraiser, right? It doesn't matter what their oh. diagnosis was um, oh. or anything like that. And you said it doesn't matter what they're raising money for, right? No, no, I don't. Like, you know, one of the things that we see in our grant applications every single year are not only the health insurance premiums and the medical bills and the co-pays and sort of the obvious cancer-related things, but also the gym memberships. You know, when someone has struggled with the physical effects of cancer and they go through the requisite 60 days or whatever it is of PT, and then I know my insurance company was like, well, we're not going to pay for it anymore, so you can go join a gym. 
and I didn't have the money to just go join a gym. You know, so things like that, things like starting a family, because if you can't go about it the traditional way, it ends up costing a huge amount of money. So all of those things are sort of fair game for setting up fundraisers. Yeah, so that's, um, yes, um, and I'm happy to sort of reiterate that because um, there's way too many things that can sort of um, fall by the wayside, um, which is another thing that drives me absolutely insane because people, I think, have this weird notion that just because most people have to have insurance now, like somehow there's, that's like this magical wand that's waved and like all of a sudden it doesn't cost anything. So. Um, Yes, you can use it for whatever you need. Um, you know, Dina one month had to spend um, close to $500 on ice packs because she was having scalp infections um, from losing her hair. You know, needing to spend money, like I said, on vitamin water. Um, there's another kind of great story, and I know I keep using this as an example, but um, Dina had a friend who donated money and specifically told her she wanted her to use it for, like, cable or, like, a Hulu account so that she could like watch whatever she wanted when she wasn't feeling good. You know, if you need to go get a manicure or if you want to go get a massage or like use it to go out to dinner so that you feel somewhat normal, then like by all means go for it. Like this is not about like having restrictions as to like how your life is affected by a cancer diagnosis. Because you know, I think only you know how your life is affected. Um, and this is about, you know, trying to keep the things that feel stressful at bay so that you can get better and like not have things get worse. Well, this is all pretty awesome. And I am so sorry to see that we are nearing the hour mark. So we are going to switch it back to our last slide here. Dun, dun, dun. Maybe we're going to switch back to our last slide. and. I just want to remind everybody that this webinar recording will be available on our website, which is on the screen now, the samfund.org slash webinar, or on our YouTube channel, which is SamFund TV. You can certainly listen to that at any time and share it with anyone you know who is struggling to pay for whatever it is they're struggling to pay for um, who has gone through cancer in their life, because this is such an incredible resource and everybody should know about it. So on a quick side note before we wrap this up, I just wanted to ask everybody to please complete the post-webinar survey. It's a, at bit.ly slash standby1, S-T-A-N-D-B-U-Y-1, and that's whether you're listening live or listening to a recorded version. We're constantly going back to these surveys to try and identify future topics, to try and um, increase the effectiveness of these presentations, and basically just make the webinar series as helpful to you, our young adult community, as possible. So we also keep our surveys very short, so please take a minute or two to complete it. And you can email us at any time at webinars at the samfund.org if you have ideas for other topics or any other feedback that you want to share. So with that, we will end today's presentation. Sashka, thank you so, so much, not only for taking the time today to present on standby, but for creating it in the first place and for putting this amazing resource out into the cancer community for people who need it the most. So it's such a pleasure to listen to you as always, and I'm really looking forward to, to working with you this year and far beyond this year. I think what you're doing is so great, so thank you for doing this. Likewise, and I really, um, I really appreciate you having me. And I just wanted to um, just say that um, my email um, is sashka at standby.us. So it's S-A-S-H-K-A at standby.us. Um, and I'm really always happy to answer any questions um, privately or via phone um, at any time ever. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And thank you guys so much for, um, for having me. I really appreciate it. Excellent. Thanks, Sashka, and thanks, everybody. Okay.